It's a great honor and a privilege to be standing here this morning and to be sharing in this exciting, inspiring, awesome, mind-boggling experience. I am grateful to God for Bishop David Oedipo and for his leadership. The most remarkable thing about him is the way he handles his greatness with humility. Last night, when we arrived at about one in the night, he took myself and Pastor Miles Monroe on a drive around the campus. We went to the university, and I concluded that he was not normal. There was, there was something radically unnormal with his thinking. And um, everything you see here doesn't make sense. Nothing makes sense in this place. Everything is abnormal. And uh, and I'm still recovering from that tour. And uh, it's just amazing what God can do. And it's also amazing what a man can do with God. Because God works with people. And he works through people. And I want to register my respect to you, sir, for your leadership, for your inspiration. He is a voice for our continent. He's a light for our continent. He's showing Africa the way to reconstruction and the way to transformation. Africa's path to greatness resides, as you probably know by now, not in our governmental institutions, because I have a feeling that our governments are as perplexed as the people are with the problems of Africa. I think the government gets so perplexed that the only way they respond to their perplexity is just to sit down and do nothing. You know, sometimes you get so overwhelmed by a problem that you just sit down and admire the problem. And I have a feeling that is where most governments in Africa have come to. But when you come to Canaan land, your mind is stretched. Your spirit is stretched. Your belief system is rearranged. Your concepts of life are redefined. And your eyes are ignited with hope. So I trust that this morning as I share the word of God with you, something will happen in your life that will stretch your mind and stretch your thinking. My dear friend, uh, Bishop Ajinasari, ministered tremendously, and as he inferred in his message, he is not like me, and I'm not like him. I have known him for so many years, have admired his tremendous miracle ministry, and the most remarkable thing about his ministry is the simplicity with which he ministers in miracles because most Africans with miracle ministry have a very mystical approach to miracles. And uh, 
That's another story for another day. So I will not get into that. But, but he simplifies the ministry that God has given to him. And uh, what a blessing he was to us a few minutes ago. And uh, what can I say about the crazy man from Bahamas? <laughs> Miles Monroe. These two guys are not normal. We should leave them alone. They came from some planet somewhere on our, on our continent. When I, when I hang around them, I, I just feel like a nurse at a doctor's convention. Anyone who has observed our continent of Africa will come out with questings. And probably the most important question everybody would ask is, why? Why are we where we are? Why can the continent that is blessed with so much have so little? Why can a continent with the greatest resource be the poorest? And many people have tried to provide answers to why. And some people have said that Africa is where it is or we are where we are because of what we are. And those who say that imply that there is something wrong genetically with the African brain. And most people think that there is something wrong with being black. Some also say that we are where we are because of where we are. They say that because they feel that the location of Africa, especially with within the tropics is not advantageous to us. Some have proposed that the African sun is so hot that it has a tendency to fry the brains of its natives. So by the time you walk through the sun for a while, you go through some uh, omelet process. Some also say we are where we are because of how we have been treated. The white man didn't treat us well and so on. Colonialism and imperialism and apartheid and slavery and so on. My answer is that we are where we are because of what we believe and do. You can never act beyond what you believe. And you cannot believe beyond what you know. And so what you know has a direct relationship to what you believe and what you believe has a direct relationship to what you do. So if you want to change what you do, then you change what you believe. If you want to change what you believe, you change what you know. And this morning, I'm going to attempt a process of changing what we know. At the turn of the 20th, 21st century, late 1999, the world was entering the new millennium. And uh, there was a lot of assessment as to how far the world has come and how much we have done in the last several thousand years. And Time magazine, which is one of the respected magazines in the world, tried to identify the most significant person we have produced in the last 100 years. That is in the, in the 20th century from 1900 to 1999. They wanted to find who, who on earth, who in our world, who are in our time had been the most influential. And they went through presidents and everybody. And they settled on one individual called Albert Einstein. And for those of you who are physicists and scientists, you might have come across Albert Einstein. He's one of those crazy people like your bishop. They come up with ideas that, you know, you wonder where they, they thought about it and how come you didn't think about it first? 
Albert Einstein developed a lot of theories I'm not going to attempt to bring to your notice. But he made a statement which I want to bring to your notice. And I'm going to premise what I say today and let a lot of things I say today on that statement. Albert Einstein, who Time Magazine considered the most significant person that has stepped on the world scene in the last 100 years, said the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level we were at when we created them. And I'll say that again. The significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level we were at when we created them. Simply, Albert Einstein says, if you are at level one in life and you create a problem at level one and you continue to stay at level one, you cannot solve the problems of level one. So if you are at level one and you create a problem at level one, you must necessarily have to move to level two in order to solve the problems of level one. So if you stay at the same level you were at, you can't solve the problems you have now. And that's why you have this meeting because this meeting is taking you to a higher level so you can solve the significant problems you came with. And for Africa to make advances, we have to start moving beyond where we are. And I'm going to take you through the scriptures on a journey. My message today is titled, By the Future. By the Future. Please stand with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 25. Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to read from verses 20 to 34. A most remarkable story about two young men called Jacob and Esau. For your information, Genesis is at the beginning of your Bible. It's nowhere in the middle or at the end. It's just the beginning. Now, although everybody is anointed here, some people don't know where Genesis is, so it's, it's helpful to help them. It's not a sin not to know where Genesis is. Maybe you just came to church the first time today. Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to read from verse 20 to 34. Now, I want you to pay close attention to what we read because we're going to explore this text in such a way that it will liberate you to do extraordinary things for God in your time. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, if all is well, why am I like this? So she went, to inquire, he, she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. I want you to take note of that. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth... Indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter. A man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew. Isaac came in from the field. He was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. What is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Isaac, uh, Esau, 
bread and lentil of stew, so he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This encounter between Jacob and Esau, which we, we are very familiar with, where Esau sells the birthright to Jacob, did not begin at this time. It was based on a sequence of events that had happened. Had three things I want you to note about that scripture. First thing is the prophetic positioning of Jacob and Esau. Their prophetic positioning. When Rebecca was pregnant, the Bible says she sensed a struggle within her. So she inquired of the Lord and the Lord gave her the response to the cause of the struggle. The Lord said the reason why you are struggling is because two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. So although literally or naturally, Rebecca was pregnant with two individuals, which we will describe as twins, the Bible or God did not see them as two individuals or twins. When she inquired of the Lord, God said two nations are in your womb and two peoples shall be separated from your body. That means that Jacob and Esau are prophetic pictures of nations. There are two kinds of nations you are going to find in the world. You're going to find Esau nations and you're going to find Jacob nations. And there are two kinds of people you're going to find on the earth. You're going to find Esau people and Jacob people. The Esau's and the Jacob's do not behave the same way and do not get the same results. As a matter of fact, there is always a struggle between Esau nations and Jacob nations, Esau people and Jacob people. And the Bible says that of these two nations, one will be stronger than the other and the one will serve the other. And you know that it was Esau who served Jacob and Jacob became the stronger one. The second thing I want you to note about Jacob and Esau is that they had different productive systems. First, we've seen the pr prophetic picture. I want you to look at the productive systems of Jacob and Esau. In verse 27, the Bible says, So the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mad man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his food. And Rebekah loved Jacob. Esau was two things. The Bible says he was a skillful hunter. Everybody say skillful hunter. And number two, he was a man of the field. Everybody say a man of the field. And Jacob was not a hunter. The Bible says he was a mild man. Everybody say mild man. And he was dwelling in tents. Everybody say dwelling in tents. So you realize that Jacob and Esau were opposites. One dwelt in tents and the one dwelt in the field. One was a hunter. The other was a mild man. The other word for mild man was a cultivator. A cultivator. He was a cultivator. Esau was a hunter. Jacob was a cultivator. Now what is the difference between Esau and Jacob hunter and cultivator? Because when you understand the difference between these two cultures, then you will understand why their destinies became different. Who is a hunter? A hunter does three things. One, he uses physical strength to produce. For a hunter to produce, he has to run after what he's, he's trying to hunt. He's going to run after the animals, run after game, and he's using a lot of physical energy. Number two, a hunter pursues one animal at a time. So if a hunter goes into the field and starts running after an animal, he cannot hunt for 10 at a time. He goes for one at a time. 
So he uses an, an, a lot of energy, but he targets one thing at a time. So a lot of energy, but he produces very little results. And number three, and which is the most important thing about hunters, a hunter kills what he hunts for. He uses a lot of, a lot of energy. He goes for one thing at a time. And whatever he gets, he kills it. The cultivator, Jacob, was different. How were they different? The cultivator uses ideas to produce, not physical strength. He uses ideas to produce. Number two, he works with several animals at a time. And number three, the cultivator grows and increases what he has. So therefore, if, if Jacob and Esau were given an animal, for example, if you gave a goat or two goats, a male and a female, to Jacob and Esau, one is a hunter, one is, the other is a cultivator. If, if Esau saw the female and the male goat, he will run after them and kill them. If Jacob saw the same female and male goat, he would take them home and breed them and multiply them. So, for the hunter, for the hunter, everything he has, has only one life cycle. For the cultivator, everything he has, has eternity in it. So the cultivator multiplies, the hunter subtracts. And these two boys were twins. They worked together in the same environment. The Jacob nations and Esau nations function differently. An Esau nation will have much. But most Esau nations will focus on only one thing. And even what they focus on, they kill it. Jacob nations do not focus on one thing. And whatever they get, they multiply it. God said there are two nations in your womb. Now, you and I are part of the world that has been described sociologically as the third world nations. We refuse it, but we are described like that. One of the characteristics of every third world nation is that they have one primary commodity. In Nigeria, it's oil. In Ghana, it's gold. In Zambia, it's copper. In, uh, if you go to almost every third world country, there's only one thing they run after. They run after it with all their energy. Everybody focuses on one thing, whether it's gold, it's copper, it's bauxite, it's oil, it's, it's granites. And even when they get it, instead of multiplying it, they kill it. And that's why the Bible says, two nations are in your womb. One will be greater. That means if you follow the system of Esau, you will serve the system of Jacob. The system of Jacob may not start with much, but it will continue to multiply. And it multiplies not by physical energy, but by ideas. There is an interesting verse in Proverbs. Very interesting. Proverbs chapter, chapter 12, verse 27. Very interesting verse of scripture. It says, Proverbs 12, 
27 and it reads the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting but diligence is man's precious possession the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting this verse doesn't seem to make sense because it says the lazy man everyone say the lazy man say it again the lazy man does not roast what he hunts for that means that the lazy man hunts is that not so now if somebody hunts do you call him a lazy man isn't he hard working a person who goes into the forest and hunts for animals do you call him a lazy man normally you wouldn't call him a lazy man. but the bible says the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting so the problem of the lazy man is not that he is not able to hunt the problem of the lazy man is that he is not able to roast now what does it mean to roast to roast is to process a raw material into a finished product if you hunt for raw meat you cannot eat it raw for you to eat it raw it must go through a process the process is called roasting and when you roast it it now becomes edible but the lazy man only hunts for raw material and leaves the raw material in its raw state the lazy man never processes what it hunts for. And so when you go to most nations which are called third world, you'll find this phenomenon the Bible describes. They are great producers of raw material and not refiners of what they produce. They don't roast what they took in hunting. And so if you come to my dear great country, Ghana, we are great producers of gold, but there is no gold refinery in Ghana. Ghana, for a long time, was the leading producer of cocoa, but you struggle to find chocolates. You have to go to Switzerland to get the best chocolates. Why? Because we export what we have in raw state to, to Switzerland. It is refined and sold back to us. It's called the Esau system. And so you have a great nation like Nigeria, the sixth largest producer of oil in the world, which has four non-functioning oil refineries and has to import finished product the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting and so if you saw Esau at work you would think Esau was the most hard-working man in the world he was a hunter but he was not roasting what he was taking in hunting so one day Esau goes to hunt and he comes home and he's hungry and Jacob who did not go to hunt has food that is a contradiction in terms that is a senseless arrangement but it happened the one who is going for food has no food the one who didn't run after food has food so the question is where did jacob get the ingredients to cook his stew because he was not a hunter he was a cultivator I was not there but let me paint you a scenario of something that happened I'm sure Esau went to the field one day and brought a big antelope or a deer or something that 
he had hunted for, but it was not dead. It was weak. Weak, almost dying. And Jacob says, brother, don't kill it. Just leave it for me. I will take care of it. Because he's not a hunter. He doesn't kill what he has. He grows it. So he takes the animal and he takes it to the back of his house. And he begins to nurse it and nurture it. Another time his brother comes with another animal. Jacob says, don't kill it. I will take care of it. He nurtures it. And before long, at the back yard of Jacob, the animals he had rescued, he was nurturing and cultivating, are now producing. And they are producing more animals. And they are producing more animals. Now what is happening is, he is increasing his stock, but Esau is having diminishing returns. Because if you keep hunting in the forest, the animals will get finished. So one day he goes hunting and he catches nothing. And he comes home and the man who didn't go hunting has food to eat. I was amazed when I went to Europe and I went to London to Buckingham Palace and I saw the gold in Buckingham Palace. They had so much gold. And I realized Britain doesn't produce gold. It produces coal. Gold is yellow. Coal is black. But they didn't have coal in Buckingham Palace. They had gold. Ghana produces gold. And when you go to the seat of government, there is no gold. So how come the person who didn't hunt for gold has gold and the ones who hunted for gold have no gold? God says, two nations are in your womb. One will be greater than the other and one will serve the other. The reason why African nations are weak and serve is not because we are under a curse it's because we operate a system that produces the results that have been predicted by scripture that if you produce by the paradigm of Jacob you will serve uh, by, by the paradigm of Esau you will serve a Jacob the Jacobs of this world they don't sweat they take it easy they let the Esau's do all the hard work. And they take what the Esau's have. And they multiply it. Switzerland is the diamond headquarters of the world. They don't produce diamonds. Where do the diamonds come from? Botswana and Namibia. Go to Namibia. You will not find any polished diamonds. They are all in Switzerland. Because we all produce hunters. And we sell to Jacob. And Jacob refines it and sells it back to us ten times more. And then we cry and we want to kill Jacob. The problem is not Jacob. The problem is an Esau mentality. And until we change the Esau mentality, we are always going to serve. That's why Albert Einstein said the significant problems we face at this time cannot be solved at the same level we were at when we created them. If you want to solve the African problem, you move ahead from an Esau lifestyle to a Jacob lifestyle. The two brothers meet and they have a negotiation. Esau says to Jacob, and I, I, I want you to take note of what he said. He says, I want the same red stew that you have. I want the same thing. I don't want my own. I want what you have. He didn't say, I want the recipe 
for producing the stew you have. He said, I want the same stew. Esau's are consumers of finished product. Esau's don't look for the process to produce their own. They only buy what others have produced. Do you know that as of now, Africa has become the dumping ground of the world? Oh yeah, everybody produces for the African market. Most of the things we wear in Africa, even African fabrics, are not printed in Africa. They are printed in Austria and sold to us. Industries are dead. And it's not just the nation, but there are also Esau individuals. In this auditorium, there are Esau's and there are Jacob's. What does Jacob do? Jacob buys the future. Esau sells the future. Jacob uses what he has to acquire what he desires. Esau uses what he desires to sell what he has. Jacob invests today's seed in order to acquire tomorrow's forest. Esau consumes today's seed and hopes for a great harvest tomorrow. He said to Jacob, feed me with the same stew you have. I have an idea or an impression that that was not the first time he was doing it. I have an impression he's been doing it for a long time. So he says, brother, Give me the stew you have. The same thing you have. I'm tired. I'm weary. I, I, I've worked so hard. I deserve stew. And Jacob says, fine. Stew is available. But there is something called trading in this world. I take what you have and I give you what I have. So you want my stew? I want something you have. It's called birthright. Stew is in the present. Birthright is in the future. Stew can be seen. Birthright cannot be seen. Stew can be eaten today. Birthright will cook tomorrow. So Esau says, I want your today. Jacob says, I want your tomorrow. Esau says, give me what you have now. Jacob says, give me what you will become tomorrow. And I can give you everything I have today if you just give me what I cannot see but I know you will become. It's called a birthright. The fact that you have a birthright doesn't mean you will fulfill it. Some have a birthright of blessing but they sell it. And Jacob says, give me your birthright and listen to what Esau says. He says, I am about to die. And what is this birthright to me? And you and I know he was not about to die. He was just hungry one evening. And you don't die for being hungry one evening. But Esau's create desperation and because they say they create desperation they sell themselves cheap those who make themselves desperate sell themselves cheap he says i'm about to die what is this birthright to me give it to me and i'll be fine jacob says fine if you're so desperate i'll give you the birthright but for a moment i want you to swear to the Lord. I want you to sign the document. We're going to do a contract now and I want you to sign it. Because I know that after you've eaten the stew and you are happy, you will deny you ate my stew. So we have to sign the contract to show that this day you ate my stew and this day 
you legally and spiritually transferred your birthright. So the Bible says, Esau did it and the birthright changed. And then when you look at their story, something happened. The day of the blessing comes. And what happens when the day of blessing comes? Isaac calls Esau and says, Esau, I'm about to die. And I want to bless you with the birthright. Go and make stew for me. Now, at that time, Esau should have been very honest to say, Dad, I sold the birthright 20 years ago to Jacob, so you don't need to bless me. Bless Jacob. Because, you know, many times I've heard people preach, and I used to preach it myself, and say that Jacob stole Esau's birthright. But the scripture never said that. Jacob never stole Esau's birthright. As a matter of fact, it was Esau who was attempting to steal Jacob's birthright. Why? Because the birthright has been negotiated for, it had been signed in heaven, and before God Almighty, the owner of the birthright was Jacob and not Esau. But Esau sells the birthright, but he wants to use another means to acquire what he has sold. He's a thief. And what happened? His father says, go and make me a stew. And the only way he need, knows to make a stew is to go where he's been going, to the forest. So he runs. <sighs> running after animals and uh, antelopes and trying to catch something and struggling. And when his mother heard the same instruction, he said to Jacob, go behind the house to the animals you've been grooming all these years. Because there is a blessing coming and you don't need to go to the forest to get the ingredients to acquire your blessing because you've been nurturing your blessing right behind your house all these years. So what happens? Esau is in the forest. Jacob goes to the back of the house and he cooks a stew with his mother. The Esau's of this world use physical energy and hard work. The Jacob's of this world use proper planning. Isaac says, cook me a stew such as my soul loves and I will bless you. Who is the best person to cook a stew that the soul of Isaac loves. Who? Isaac's wife. So Jacob teamed up with the best aspect, the best human resource aspect, the best strategist, the best person who could deliver the product his father was looking for. And since he didn't have the capacity, he hired the services of somebody who had the capacity to produce what his father was looking for. So he teamed up with his mother and they cooked a stew. And Isaac ate it. And it's interesting. Isaac couldn't tell the difference between the stew made from meat in the bush and the stew made from meat in the backyard. He couldn't tell the difference. That means the journey of Esau was a nonsensical journey. He had no business going there because if he had also had stock in the backyard, he would have gone to catch goat. Don't keep your goats in the forest. You have to keep your goats in the backyard. And the way to keep your goats in the backyard is to nurture what you have and grow what you have. Do you know? Do you know that money stays in the hands of Asians seven times longer than in the hands of Africans? 
What does that mean? It means that when an African has money, instantly he wants to spend it. When an Asian has money, he doesn't spend it. He keeps it and he invests it and he multiplies it before he starts spending. And so you have a lot of people who earn their salary and then they spend their salary. They are Esau's. They earn it and kill it. They hunt for it and kill it at the end of the month. They hunt for it and kill it at the end of the month. And so they eat from what you call hand to mouth. Hand to mouth. Hunt, kill. Hunt, kill. So for a lot of people, at the end of the month when they receive their salary, everything has already been spent. Everything. No savings. Every individual must invest, sow seed in God. Sow seed in yourself and sow seed into your future. You should live as a matter of fact, God never designed human beings to spend 100% of what they earn. Human beings are supposed to spend a minimum of 70% of what they earn. God said the tithe belongs to me and beyond the tithe, you have to also sow into yourself and you also have to sow into your future. If you don't do that, there will never be stock. There will never be resource available for you when you need to tap it. And that was the problem with Esau. So when his father needed a goat, he had to go back to the forest and start from the scratch as if all his life he had acquired nothing. By this time, he should have had something ready, but he had nothing ready. And he comes, and when he comes, he's late. You know, there is something about the African system. And it's great to have a place like this in Africa. But this is just a tiny little dot on our continent. If you leave this campus, the rest of it doesn't make any impression on you. So we come here, but we go to duplicate. There is something about the African system where people are blessed with much but achieve very little. And you know the statistics. We have the greatest resources in the world. We have everything. But we hunt for it and we kill it. The greatest trading partner of Africa is Europe. We sell everything and they sell it back to us four times. We sell everything and they sell it back to us four times. That was the Esau problem. So when Esau comes, the blessing is gone. And yes, he, it, he was not the owner of the blessing. Some people say, well, but Jacob deceived his father. And yes, Jacob deceived his father, and that was wrong. I think what Jacob should have done was just to have told his father, you know, Dad, 20 years ago, me and Esau sat down, and we swore before the Lord. And, and Esau sold the birthright to me. So truly, I'm the owner of the birthright. And Jacob, who is Isaac, who respected covenant, would still have blessed him. He didn't need to disguise himself. Because the blessing was his. He had bought it legally, legitimately, and rightly. And no wonder God never, ever rebuked Jacob for stealing his brother's birthright. In the world, whether in sports or whatever you do, you're going to come across people who operate the Esau system and the Jacob system. In the boxing world, there is this boxing promoter. He's quite a strange individual. He has... A hair that looked as if a bomb was thrown into it. His hairstyle looks like somebody lit a bomb. An explosion took place in it. He's a boxing promoter. He's never fought anybody. 
But if you talk to every boxer from Muhammad Ali to Mike Tyson, they will tell you he has all their money. Now, how did he get their money? He went, these guys were hungry people who were looking for opportunity. He signs contract with them. He says, I'll make you a champion. You make me a millionaire. He puts the people in the ring. They get boxed. They sign. They earn the money. And a huge percentage goes to him. Then later on, they get angry and upset. And they take him to court. And he says, well, but you signed it. They say, well, but we, we, we didn't know we'll be dead rich. But you signed it. But we didn't know it will happen this way. But you signed it. Ignorance is not an excuse, my brother. That's why you don't ever negotiate with somebody when you are hungry. Don't ever negotiate in hunger. Because if you are hungry, you will negotiate your birthright very easily. And don't ever negotiate when you are tired. You know, for me, the most amazing thing about Esau is not even that he sold the birthright. But he sold it for only one meal. Now, if I was Esau, I would say, fine. Give me the best, I'll give you the better, but you will feed me three times a day for the rest of my life. But he just negotiated for supper. And breakfast was coming in 12 hours time. He didn't negotiate for breakfast. He didn't negotiate for lunch. Just one supper. You may be hungry today. But remember your birthright. And when you remember your birthright, protect your future. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about how Esau turned the situation around. Because, you see, You would later discover that Esau turned his situation around. And you discover he had a paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift began a process of recovery for him. Then you will also discover that Jacob himself, after all this, became an Esau. Because you see, Esau doesn't have a copyright on Esau. And Jacob doesn't have a copyright on Jacob. A Jacob can become an Esau and an Esau can become a Jacob. So you will discover, you will discover that when, when Jacob was going to marry, he became an Esau. He allowed what he saw today to take what he will have in seven years. He is the most unintelligent, the most unsophisticated, the craziest lovebird I've ever seen. This guy is so dumb. He says, I love this woman so much, I'm negotiating seven years' salary to marry her. Now, what would you do after you marry her when you've negotiated away the salary? Then when he was given the raw deal, he renegotiated the contract for another seven years, 14 years. So Jacob's can also become Esau's. But the good news is that you can begin as an Esau and become a Jacob. You can begin as an Esau and renegotiate the whole deal. And we're going to look at the process to get out. Because that is the most important thing. Because our nations are already Esau. But we have to start negotiating our way out of Esau to become Jacob's. And I trust that in your life, 
God will do something in your life that will break the yoke of Jacob off your neck and cause you to turn your situation around. There is hope for Africa. And we will solve the significant problems we are faced with. Already, it has been shown in Canaan land that it can be done. And it will be shown all across the continent that it can be done. We can solve the significant problems. Not with an Esau paradigm, but with a Jacob paradigm. Because God has blessed the house of Jacob and cursed the house of Esau. But Esau can become a Jacob when he turns around. Thank you.